those things together as one as one element. And today we have a number of issues, and these are things that you're always facing. Um, but part particularly today, I mean, there's c constant issues: uh, the economy, global warming, you know, uh, uh, and four hundred one k's, the deficit. All these things are things we're facing. So when you're doing an urban design plan, when you're dealing with city design, you have to address these kinds of issues. Um, and this is something that's very widespread. When you want to know what's going on in the cities, you can almost go and look at uh, a newsstand, go to Squirrel Hill Newsstand and see all the headlines, and they usually are pointing you in the direction of things are going. Um, for instance, this Time Magazine cover was intriguing to me, uh, the end of excess, why this crisis is good for America. We are facing uh, serious issues, and when we're thinking about things, cities are really uh, the right place to start to deal with a number of these issues. Um, and it's things that we've been talking about for a long time. Our firm has actually been in business since 1964. I'm the fourth generation of partners in the firm. Um, one of my partners here, uh, Ray Gindros, lives around the corner here in Squirrel Hill. Um, we're, we're a firm that's really based on process. I'm here tonight to talk to you about, it's fun, I got the opportunity to talk to you about what I would recommend for Squirrel Hill. Um, generally, we don't work that way. Um, you know, we're trained designers. We're trained uh, to look at cities and to make recommendations. And we almost never work that way. Our, our, our way we work is actually through a process. We do community meetings like this one, and we ask people what they think, and those become part of the plan. So it's about the process. We do provide urban design, and we do provide pattern books, which are kind of technical design guidelines. Um, and we do provide uh, architecture. We provide um, building design as part of our services. But I'm really going to focus on urban design tonight and about placemaking. Um, the way we approach things is very different than many other planning firms. Um, many firms will um, go out and they're the experts and they'll tell you what they think your community, community should, should be like, which is kind of what I'm doing tonight. So it's, it's, a, it's quite different, but I'm, this is for free. I, I get the chance to do this, it's kind of fun. But, but generally we work uh, quite, the way we work is we'll deal with qualitative issues, which you see up at the top there. And we, we always ask, what should this place feel like? That's a very community-driven issue. So we would say, what, what would you like to see in your community? How do you, how, what, would it like, you know, what would you like to see us with, with, do with this corner? Um, how should it feel like? What should it be like to walk down the street? Um, those are qualitative issues. That we also deal with quantitative issues. What is possible in this context? What can we do within the framework of the current uh, zoning regulations? What can we do within our budget? Those are things that are quantitative issues. UDA, and what we do is this line right here. Uh, we pull those things together and then help create a vision that's community driven. Um, so the, the, what we use is we use public input, we use testing, and we use uh, 3D imagery. Those kinds of things are, are things that are, are part of the way we approach these things, uh, uh, these kinds of problems. This is uh, one of our tools. It's an analysis drawing. We do a, a number of different types. This is just one that's very simple for a community that was built in the 1930s, and you can see some of the things that are revealed are missing buildings and missing uh, parts and pieces. But generally, you can see uh, there's a very clear layout to the city. Though this is uh, one of a many, many a series of drawings we do, but the reason I wanted to show this particular series is that um, it's very clear about some of the way we work with communities. We, when we go out and we ask people uh, what they think, we always start with what are the good things um, about your city. Um, it's a little bit like psychotherapy for cities. Um, you know, that's the way you get people together and build common ground around things that you agree on. Um, and, and we usually give we give everybody three dots. Um, you know, you always get sometimes you get people putting um, a green dot on their you know their neighbor's house or something like that. But but generally you get a, a general sense that people are contributing and starting to tell you about the things they like. We also you'll also see we we put a summary here in the right hand corner. We also ask people and we actually write things down. Um, things that they like. For instance, they like the uh, sense of community and the hometown feel and the landscaping. We get a sense of what's working. Um, then we also talk about what's not working. What are the things, what are the red dots, what are the bad things that, about your community? And you can see that there's actually, in this particular community, there's a series of clusters around these, these uh, um, two groups of housing, which were actually public housing, which were not well maintained. They were not, there's a lot of code violations and things like that. So that, sur that surfaced in the process. The other thing was, we talked about where are the places you'd like us to focus on? Where would you like us to work, spend our time? And those are the blue dots. Um, and, and they talked about gateways and the, uh, help make the community safe and so forth. So the final um, you know, assembly of these things becomes the framework for our plan. Now, as I mentioned, we, you know, we're a team of uh, uh, people in the office. We're professional urban designers and trained. We could come up with probably a pretty darn good plan 
but it would never be the community's plan, and it would never be the right plan. Uh, the right plan is always the one that, uh, where people have actually contributed and helped make the plan real. Um, then, but the other thing is that what's important about that is you start to build support and a bandwagon of support of where to spend their time. You know, one of the things we learned about was focusing on these cities, uh, I'm sorry, on these roads, the uh, center of town and the park, and, and fixing these um, two public housing projects as part of the plan uh, that we were working on. Um, as part of our process, we always use uh, perspectives. We use drawings uh, so we can start to, when we hear things, we can actually draw them on site. And we bring an illustrator with us, and he actually draws in the context of a community like this. So as people are giving them ideas, this is a very rural uh, perspective. You'll see some of ours that are much more urban. But this one I put because it had all the pencils and things like that, so you can see we were. But we do draw these things on site. Um, and I wanted to, those are a very important uh, consensus to building tool so that people can start to see their ideas going into paper and, and get a sense of what the place could feel like. Uh, one of our projects here, um, I just wanted to give you a sense of, we worked all over the world, but we did do the North Shore plan here, uh, which has been in the news a lot lately because um, uh, there's a, um, uh, about some property acquisition. But one of the, this was actually taking uh, a, a previous uh, kind of master plan or previous plan for the Three River Stadium and the parking lots around it and repositioning that for the future. Uh, it was, um, you know, it was a parking lot that was used um, eight days a year um, and <coughs> was really not necessarily the highest and best use, but we created a kind of flexible framework for, um, uh, for new development to go in between and reset the stadiums. And the, the sale of that property helps pay for the stadiums. Um, that rainbow there, we, we also put that, that one yeah. there. That's, that we, uh, we, we put that in as part of the design. Um, <laughs> we, um, so really, this is, you can start to see, this is kind of our early framework of blocks and streets uh, that would be, then be part of the city and be a real place that would, have, that would be flexible. It would work for events, but it would also be part of people's lives over the long term. We did actually, interestingly, we did a similar plan for Cincinnati when you see the two stadiums split and break the, the parks that bring the, the river to the city and the city to the river. We're working on areas like in Utah. This is a project that I've been working on where we're trying to bring back a neighborhood into a city um, that, has never, that hasn't had that uh, tradition for a while. And how do you make cities actual collections of neighborhoods, kind of like Squirrel Hill in Pittsburgh. Um, we've also worked in new communities. Uh, we worked in, this is a town called Celebration. Uh, which was done in the early 90s before I was with the firm, but it was a Disney town. But it, what, one of the, the issues with what we were trying to do was to try to change the paradigm of, of new, new community development into something new, a mix of uses, a community that can grow, can change, uh, much like uh, current communities like Squirrel Hill in, in, this, in the city. Um, and some of these, this is a different community, but we've also been trying to find ways to have frameworks for the life and, and for organic change uh, um, and um, kind of places where people can start to feel community. Um, and we're working on new residential developments and, and new typologies that have not been done before. This one is in, in Utah as well. It's a much more kind of modern um, building type. Uh, we're working, we've taken this overseas. Uh, this is a, a new town in Scotland. Uh, we're working for the Princess Foundation here. Uh, this is the kind of mixed-use core. And this is actually under construction uh, right now. Um, cities in India. Uh, we've worked there, and my partners are actually also working on the expansion for St. Petersburg, Russia, an area of the city of over 250,000 people. Um, so we work at very large scales, uh, but we also work at small scales too, um, and I wanted to share a, a, a little story for you. This is actually in, in New Orleans, in Lafitte, where we do some of these kind of transformations of what a city can, uh, can, can be changed and, and, and what it can look like, but helping setting people's expectations. And um, unfortunately, I don't have a slide of it today, but we also, this has actually been built, um, and it's been very successful. Um, this is a, another little story of, a, of a two areas of Richmond, uh, where there was two successful neighborhoods, and there was a very challenged uh, uh, group in between of buildings that made it very uncomfortable to go through. There was muggings, it was very unsafe. Um, and one of the things we did was to actually uh, build consensus as a group with, this, with the community uh, to restore these buildings to actually bring back the street framework that was there once before. Uh, so you can start to see on the left side here, here's some of the buildings under uh, restoration. This is in progress. You can see this building on the right is still still about to be preserved. And then, so now you can see the before and after. This is a very welcoming street, one that uh, encourages people to walk between the two communities. So this idea of urban acupuncture 
is something that we find very important. How do you pick the part of the city, the one thing that you, you want to spend your time that will have the most catalytic changes um, for the community? Um, and this made a huge, a huge influence for Richmond. We've had great feedback there. A project that's very near and dear to my heart is one that I managed, which was a pattern book for Habitat for Humanity. Um, uh, one of the things that we, we did learn, this is a, was a national pattern book, is that uh, it was, we worked on this through a, um, a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts, and it was given on the basis of national research, research studies that told us that 93% of Americans would accept affordable housing in their neighborhood if it fitted. Let me say that again. Affordable, they would accept affordable housing in their neighborhood if it fit in, 93%. Um, so that's, to me, that was actually uh, quite extraordinary. But what it told us is that this is an architectural problem. It's not a social problem. So people treat social uh, uh, affordable housing like it's a social problem. It's not. It's, it's architecture. So one of the things we were really trying to do was try to work with Habitat for Humanity to try to create houses that were much more neighborly, that were something that, that helped contribute to social mobility, that was something that people were proud of to have in the neighborhood. So that was something that we were, uh, we were very proud of and talked about, um, you know, even accessibility, building a green home that um, makes it much more affordable for a homeowner to have over a longer period of time. Uh, we also did some disaster relief. It, uh, we did a pattern book for uh, the state of Mississippi and the state of Louisiana. Um, interestingly enough, when we went down to Mississippi after the hurricane in Louisiana, the, the, the towns of the South, and the, what you visualize in the movies about the South is not there. When you're in Pittsburgh, you can go from street after street after street of a Pittsburgh street. You know, you can just take people one after another. This is this feels like Pittsburgh. Oh, you haven't seen another one. You've got to see, it. see one here. Same thing with New York. There's very much New York-like streets and New York-like experiences. But in the South, and I hope there aren't a lot of Southerners in the room here, but, <laughs> but, but uh, we noticed that, that the, the idea of the South and the real communities that make the South um, were not there. So when, after the hurricane, there was an idea that uh, everybody had, is how can we rebuild the South in a, neighbor, in a way that feels like the South again, and how can we rebuild it better than it was before? Both high quality housing and a real sense of place that you are in the South. And that's something that we've always been interested in, is how, when you're in a place, how do you know you're there? You know, how do you, when you're in Squirrel Hill, you know you're in Squirrel Hill, which I think is great. Um, and, and New York is the same way, but how can the, how can the South start to take on that kind of characteristic? So, well, I'm just going to run you through some of the things that we're seeing in today's um, development context. We're seeing a, a, that people are asking for, this is both private developers and public uh, agencies. We work for about 50-50 for both. Um, residential diversity, they want to kind of diverse, they understand that that's something valuable to their community and to their new developments. A uh, sense of place, like I mentioned, when they're in the, they, people want to know that they're part of this town, that this is something that they feel very comfortable in. Economic sustainability. And that goes a little bit with the residential diversity. Is how do you how do you build something that is going to have um, both that's going to be can flexible and change with the market over time. Um, cultural sustainability. How do they know uh, that, that that both this is kind of a relationship with kind of bringing in the arts and how the arts and and, and can also take advantage of new development and how they can kind of feed off each other. Uh, the idea of access to institutions such as libraries and universities. Uh, higher education learning, uh, that's something that's very strong. And finally, choices. People value choices. When you go to Littles, there are so many choices for shoes. Uh, there should be the same amount of choices in the way we live. Um, so I don't know if anybody is, uh, sees the same thing, but when I look at this, I always see this is Squirrel Hill right here. Uh, you have the things that we're getting, we're flying around the world uh, telling people about. Um, I think the important thing, though, for Squirrel Hill is that you have all these things. You need to make sure you don't lose them. Mm -hmm. So you're instead of, um, you know, at this point, you, you're you're not playing to win. You're playing not to lose. If that makes sense. So it's really uh, important that those kinds of things stay. So, you know, this is getting kind of part two of the presentation. Uh, for is is what are the issues for Squirrel Hill? What are the things that you, as a group, what if you're going to ask me as a as a Point Breeze resident coming in from outside? Um, what, what are the three things that you would recommend? Um, one of them is improving the mobility around town and, and maintaining the mobility. I'll talk to you about that in a minute. Um, preserving the character of Squirrel Hill, preserving the residential character, pre uh, preserving the diversity of the housing types that you have, the, the diversity of the types of people. Um, that's part of the character. The streets, uh, the, the trees in the streets and those kinds of things. 
And finally, support downtown Squirrelville. I'm going to put that as last. And, <coughs> but but I, I think actually, even though it's the last one I'm going to talk about, I think it's the center of the wheel. It's the hub of all of Squirrel Hill. And I think that if, as, if Squirrel Hill to, were to, to go the other direction and be less successful, I think Squirrel Hill as a whole will be in the same, um, same position. So improving mobility in terms of bicycling, um, I'll talk about that first. I think that one thing I've, I've noticed is that I think you can actually encourage more, use people using more alternative routes around transport. Bike Pittsburgh has done a wonderful job. I don't know if you guys know about Bike Pittsburgh or if you've seen their Bike, their bike Pittsburgh map. It's absolutely fantastic. I think that one thing I'm seeing more and more is that, and, and this goes to improving awareness, is like for instance, uh, yesterday I was standing on Forbes Avenue and. Um, and there's, and I do, I do have done this too, is a lot of people try to bike up from Carnegie Mellon on Forbes. Um, and generally I, I see a lot of times trying to, people trying to stay on the higher traffic corridors. Um, one of the things we've seen on the West Coast, uh, when I, in the Bay Area, Berkeley, would try to put their bicycle uh, ways on the, not the, the streets with less traffic rather than the streets with high traffic. So that's something I think that could be another shift for, uh, for Squirrel Hill in terms of improving mobility and access around the, around the city. And one thing I didn't mention is I, when you think about um, a great sense of place and, and great cities, um, ease of access about getting around, um, either by car, by bicycle, by, by transit, it is a key contributor no matter what. So um, these are kind of basics um, when it comes to, comes to that. Um, improving mobility of buses. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I was a W rider. Um, my W bus is no longer. That bus was full on the way into the city, um, and it was, f and I could uh, sit comfortably and read the paper. Um, now it's a, I, I can choose from the 67 or the 69, both of which are absolutely packed. I'm seeing somebody nodding here. Um, it's a, it's a very uncomfortable ride. But the, the bus system is at capacity. Um, so a lot of people may say, well, geez, you know, you're, mad, you're still getting to work just fine. The problem is that we can't take on any more riders. I've, I've stood at the, 60, at the bus stop at Forbes and Murray, and uh, there's a huge amount of people you sometimes have to wait for the second or third bus. That is unacceptable. Um, th th that is something that's very important for Squirrel Hill, and I think I would actually put it as priority one, um, is to make sure that you support public transit. It, um, for one thing is it supports a diversity of users and it supports your housing market. A lot of people um, in Squirrel Hill, you know, they go to Chatham, they go to Carnegie Mellon, they go to Pitt, Carlo, um, they work in the city, they take the bus to get back and forth. Um, this, that's something that is, a, is, is your housing market right there. Um, it also connects areas around Squirrel Hill, so it, it's your interconnected system. Uh, you, you know, sometimes I take the 74 from my house to downtown Squirrel, to downtown Squirrel Hill, and I'm sure there are people that take the bus from one area of Squirrel Hill to the other. It provides the conduit of, of, between the areas and creates one place, uh, one sense of, of Squirrel Hill itself. 74 being eliminated. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I, I'm disappointed. Actually, my new route is I connect. I take the 74 to the busway at Homewood and get in more detail than you needed. But nevertheless, that's, that's what I've done to avoid taking the 67 and the 69. So I don't know what I'm going to do. I have to take the 71 seat, which is an awful bus. Um, but but the, um, it focuses traffic on your key quarters. So it, it provides, so when you don't have people, when you don't have those buses, that's 40 cars. There's 40 people on a bus, that's 40 cars that are going to be on the other roads in your neighborhood. So your, your quiet residential neighborhoods that are off of Forbes, um, Northumberland, for instance, is quite busy. Um, it's going to get a heck of a lot busier when you start when you start because Forbes is going to be choked with traffic. So these are the opportunities that that it, asks, but that, it, that it provides, but it also brings people to downtown Squirrel Hill, which I'll talk about in a minute. And it does it without having to provide the parking. Uh, uh, parking, um, just think about it. Uh, one car takes up 350 square feet per car. Um, that's 350 square feet. So we can almost probably fit two or three cars in this particular space. So when you think about how much parking you would need to provide to support the uses that you have, you can't do it. You have to have the bus system. Yes. So, um, and this is something, by the way, when I'm talking about this, this is something that people understand all over the country. Uh, we did the master plan for South Lake Union in Seattle. Um, the whole system, the, all of the development was on the back of transit. You can see these light rail cars going down the middle. Um, so these are some of the, these are the things that are understood you know, nationwide, and it's unfortunate because here we have it in Pittsburgh. All these other cities want to want that. We have it in Pittsburgh, and we're about to lose it. Yeah. So it's, it's something that's absolutely um, counterproductive. So we, we have this opportunity. We need to maintain it, and we need to keep um, 
public transit as part of our um, as part of Squirrel Hill. Um, preserving the character and 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 of, of Squirrel Hill, and I'm going to talk about it in the context to um, di diverse housing. Um, I think that when you have um, a diverse diverse housing, it actually increases the opportunities for aging in place. I have met people that went to school and uh, that lived in Squirrel Hill when they were kids, uh, when they were in college, and you know now they have families, and they may you know retire in Squirrel Hill. Squirrel Hill has, has the opportunity to do that within a few blocks of each other. That's a very unique characteristic. Most cities don't have that, or if they do, they want to have that in their own town. You have to maintain that. So um, I think that increasing the opportunities, increasing where the baby boomers are getting older, um, increasing the opportunities for people to retire in Squirrel Hill is very important. But not at the, co not, not at the, at the cost of the character of the architecture you have right now. Um, so in some ways, you could support the uh, accessibility of existing housing. Um, I know that, you know, so that they're visitable, um, people can get around, um, people can, you know, live in their house into their, um, into their elder, elder years. That's very important, and it's um, extremely important to do that now, because the cost of doing it later um, is going to be much, much greater. Um, it also, um, the diverse housing also ma maintains your diverse market for your downtown. Um, when you have, when I go to Squirrel Hill, it's fun to see kids. It's the most intergenerational town center in all of Pittsburgh I've seen. I see young kids, families, seniors, all in the same town, which is great. Um, it's also a key ingredient to, um, to great communities, as I mentioned. Uh, we've seen that everywhere. Other cities are all trying to do that. To um, and I think it's pretty interesting that within a few blocks of each other, you can see um, apartment houses like this one. You can see townhouses like this one. And you can see... Um, Beautiful residential houses like like these. Um, I, I've, my colleague, as I mentioned, Ray Ginder, who lives around the corner, was at a conference one time and actually presented, uh, did a presentation on Squirrel Hill. And interestingly, he uh, people in the audience were convinced that it was a fabrication. They did not believe that <laughs> that, he, that, 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 that you could actually that there was a community like this. So I, that's just what you're seeing on the outside. Um, now, what I mentioned about preserving the character. Communicating the character of what architecture can be, I think, is very critical. Um, I, and I hope, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, since I'm doing this for free, I can actually go ahead and say some things that I wouldn't otherwise. But, but this is a building that's been built here in town, and I wanted to ask you, does this look like it's been in Squirrel Hill? It doesn't have to actually have exactly um, a traditional look to things. You can do these in a very modern way. But I, I think that actually building new architecture that actually fits into the community and has a Squirrel Hill feel is actually incredibly important particularly when it's replacing a residential context. Um, there's a lot of really tr tr terrific examples of residential entries in Squirrel Hill. I don't, uh, so I think that those kinds of things can be taken advantage of. And as I've noticed that there are new buildings that are coming in that are much denser, very much larger, and they're replacing residential um, um, uh, buildings. You know, when you look at how buildings like this, this is in um, Forest Hills Gardens, in, um, in, which is in Queens. Um, if you ever get a chance to go there, I highly recommend it. It's one of the most remarkable um, urban environments in all of America. It's very much like Squirrel Hill. It was designed by one hand, which is so it's a little bit different. But you'll see you'll see it. But you get the sense of there's residential scale elements on the building. Um, and when you, you get moments like this, where you're looking through the trees and, and you're getting very high density housing, but they all fit together. You can see the townhouses on the right, and then in the background you can see that's a very large apartment building. They kind of fit together as an ensemble. Those are the kinds of things that you know can happen here at Squirrel Hill, and we've done this ourselves. This is a building that we um, designed for Swickley, um, which was in a residential corridor. Unfortunately, the project is no, not going to go forward, but we, we took residential-like forms and applied that to a very large building. You can see that the roof lines here and here and so forth. So it kind of fits with a residential context. The other thing is about residential-scale entries like that one. Um, and then we also have designed a building on the way into Mount Lebanon. Uh, which was in a context of very large buildings. We took those same cues I was describing. Um, but in, in many ways, this is on the way in on Washington Boulevard. The elements like this was really about trying to monumentalize uh, the residential context and the feeling for, uh, feeling for the community. So it, it was kind of like a billboard for what you're about to see. But again, trying to fit those details into the community was important. Preserving the character of public space. Um, I, I, I know I'm probably preaching the choir here, but I would absolutely support tree planting programs in the new city. Um, maintaining city sidewalks, I think, is important. I think that's just about um, getting, um, ease of getting around and so forth. But I'm, I'm very concerned about 
when I look at um, the beautiful streets of Squirrel Hill, like this one, uh, this is Kinsman, very close to my house. Um, and you know, you look at the the sense when you're walking down a sidewalk. This is obviously it doesn't feel like it's right now uh, because there's no leaves on the trees. But when there is leaves on the trees, it's almost like you're in a room. Um, so you're in a very small context in in a larger street, and that kind of uh, is is a very uh, wonderful feeling. I think it's something that um, Pittsburgh's well, well known for, and it's I always see it when I bring people from outside the city into Pittsburgh, and they they're always absolutely shocked at how green it is. Um, and so it, it's something that I think communicates that we're, it's a healthy city, but it's also a city that's very humane and very uh, at a very very much at a human scale. So I think that's something that I I think that is um, should be paramount um, as people move forward. Um, supporting uh, downtown Squirrel Hill. Watch out for the competition. I'm very concerned uh, for Squirrel Hill because of um, East Liberty is actually, and, and you're looking at increased competition from other neighborhoods. Um, I, I have to be careful with East Liberty because we did a master plan for East Liberty to change all the roads from one way to two way. They've done that along Center Avenue. Um, and um, a lot of the, you can see that the, the two-way conversion was something that was actually made it much more comfortable as a pedestrian, which I'll talk about pedestrian comfort, um, to cross uh, the street. And, and once they kind of get that together, they've got all the moving pieces and a lot of development, developable land um, to move forward uh, very quickly. Um, uh, Shadyside and a lot of their, um, uh, has been a, uh, always been a competitor, I think, in some ways in Squirrel Hill, but uh, Regent Square too. So I'll talk about how you, I think that Squirrel Hill can actually reposition themselves. And I think it's usually, it's really centered around improving the public, public space uh, in downtown and, and really creating a, a, a really unique experience. Um, I'm going to give you, when I mentioned retailing 101, I'm not trying to be pedantic that I'm taking, that I'm, we're going to go into school. I, I actually am, am in, in deep water because this is not my area of expertise, so this is what I know. So I'm just sharing you what I, the kind of basics about retailing. So one thing I will, I will say is that Squirrel Hill is, um, is absolutely right-sized for the future. Um, I, I gave my, um, my smartphone to my wife over there um, before the, this, but I, I would be holding it up right now. That's how people are shopping right now, is, is people are not um, tr trying to sell um, uh, large quantities of, of goods and so forth is not going to come back to Squirrel Hill. Um, um, really, I think you need to be in a position where you're selling services, not stuff. Um, not trying to move gener uh, products. I have a sad story. I have a friend of mine who his brother-in-law you know, owned a store in, in Los Angeles, and it was uh, children's furniture or something like that, and cribs and so forth. And uh, they finally decided to close, and they closed um, the day that somebody came through, and she had seen everything in the store, and they were struggling. She went through, she decided what she was going to buy for all the furniture for her kid's room. And then she brought out her phone and she searched everything that she wanted. And then she said, I'm going to go buy it here and boom, done. So they were obviously wanted the service um, of knowing what to buy. But they, they were obviously going to buy the product. And it, it, when it becomes a commodity, uh, you can't compete. So what you have to do is find a way to sell the service. Um, of doing that, so and that's what where you get where why why the bike stores are successful, um, because you can buy a bike online. Right? You can go up, you can go right online, and you can order one. It's gonna, it's 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 the putting together. It's buying the right bike for you. Uh, Littles. And when I walk into Littles, I know that I'm gonna buy the shoes that fit me, and that I, those are the ones I'm gonna want. And I'm gonna, and I had these for for over a year, you know. So that that was a good decision. So um, I think it's selling services and knowledge. Is going to be the future, and it's going to be in smaller retail environments. Um, the whole, just I'm getting a little bit off track, but when you look at the suburbs and Monroeville, the whole landscape of all that has changed, and we're not going to see that for another 10 years. Circuit City went bankrupt. All these junior big box stores, um, and a lot of those, a lot of the retail environments, they all renegotiated their lease for it's ridiculously low in, the, in all the malls and all, all so, and all those sorts of places. Um, once you see about 10 years and, and all these phones have been in place, you're going to see substantial differences in the way we, we, we shop and so forth. So I think that if you're, going to, if you're going to do something successful, you have to sell something in addition to products. You also need to focus on the experience. When you go to Squirrel Hill, you have to want to, you know, you have to, want to be there. There's something you can never get from the phone, and that's experience. So um, I think that, that's helpful. I think creating a brand for Squirrel Hill. Um, people talk about a shady side like store. Um, I don't really see, hear necessarily hear people talking about a Squirrel Hill like store. I don't think that's necessarily bad because it's a very much a convenient environment, but it would be helpful to start to build that. 
Um, and finally, reach out to your retailers for feedback. Um, I, you know, I used to get my haircut at Timothy's, and then they moved to Shadyside. And it, um, when it, over the weekend was the first time I went to to get my haircut at the new ones, and I said, and I asked them, I said, what was, wh why'd you move? What was it like? What, you know, why, what's better about this location? I just asked them a bunch of questions, and I learned a considerable amount. So, asking your retailers for feedback about how it can change. Um, Squirrel Hill is actually interesting because it's very much set up like a mall. This is Monroeville Mall. Um, malls are set up with these anchors, and then there's a corridor down the middle. Um, interestingly, malls, Monroeville Mall is about 900 feet long from one to, to, one to the other. And, um, and, that, and by the way, malls are very interesting to look at, not because you want to be, they're very introverted experiences. The idea of going to the mall is actually a really upsetting experience because you've got to drive through Monroeville, and you have to park in the parking lot, deep in the parking lot, and even on a nice day, that's not a nice walk. Um, now, Squirrel Hill has the advantage that no, well, this isn't great weather, but generally, um, generally walking to Squirrel Hill is a very pleasurable experience. Um, so that kind of thing is a very external part of it. But there are com characteristics that we can learn from. So when you go to Squirrel Hill, um, you know, you have two anchors, and interestingly, the dimension of Squirrel Hill from here to here is the same as Monroeville Mall. Exactly the same. They're both 900 feet. You can check them on Google Earth. But, um, but you actually have anchors at one end. Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts, that kind of creates kind of an environment there. Um, both national retailers. Um, but really on this side, you actually have a, other anchors as well. Uh, the library, the church, JCC and Rite Aid, and then the movie theater. This kind of becomes another anchor. And so in some ways, kind of cognitively, they connect the downtown. Um, there's actually a third anchor that's Giant Eagle down here, which interestingly enough is 900 feet from there to there. <laughs> Check it out the Lord. Um, so, in terms of competition and about external experience, I think that's the way retail environments are going. And if you look at uh, downtown, that's the market. That's Market Square. And on any, I work downtown, and actually, the the Market Square is actually really remarkable on a warm day. People are outside; they're having a great time. And even on on cold days, you see that. So I think that's where re, where Squirrel Hill can go. And on the north side of Forbes, you actually have sidewalk dimensions that can support this kind of environment. There's no reason why you can't have a photograph like this in downtown Squirrel. Um, so, um, and I think it's, a lot of it is just communicating to the retailers to start to be more external in the way, um, the way they approach things. Now, Commonplace Coffee has actually done this, and I, I was really excited the other day. I was, uh, this is yesterday. Uh, it was in the 30s, and this gentleman was out here. I uh, may be in the audience today, but, but um, he was out <laughs> having his coffee, and I think that's great, but I think there's a lot more opportunities for more retailers to do this. Um, so, I think also, so in terms of the uh, public space, um, making it easier to cross the street, improving the sidewalk experience that with, with more retailers, and consider uh, wayfinding signage is kind of my final recommendation. Now, crossing the street, I think, is a big issue at Squirrel Hill, and I think that's strengthening, when I mentioned about those anchors on either end, the fact that you can connect those together as a group doesn't happen because if you look at the lines, the, 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 the lines here are almost gone. Yeah. <laughs> you really don't know. So when you're crossing, look at this poor gentleman is actually waiting. He knows that when he gets out in that street that he's no longer, it's no longer a realm for him where it's shared between pedestrians and cars. It's a, it's a realm for cars only. So you know that you're a guest when you're out there. It shouldn't be like that. It should actually be, and, and actually here's a, this was actually, I did take pictures of this. This was a woman trying to cross the road, and watch this. So she started to get out a little bit, and then she realized she wasn't going to make it in time, and actually had to get back on the sidewalk. This is actually an unfortunate experience. It should be a much more comfortable experience. There should be a lot more, um, a, a lot more time involved. Um, the other thing is that I think is, uh, is a, a somewhat sad is that you actually have to have signs mm -hmm. to remind people that there's a mid-block crosswalk. Um, because the lines are gone. So it's not necessarily the, that even that just painting the ladder striping back will be enough. Uh, the Europeans actually do this very well. They, they, and I know this would be a battle with public works, but when you look at it, the paving, it actually bleeds right into the street right there. So they actually, um, now they probably don't have, you know, big plows that they need to work for in this particular environment, but generally they know how to create an environment that's shared between bicycles and pedestrians. Um, in about the 20s or 30s, we started designing communities, and un unfortunately, we have one of these seminal communities that did this, is that started to split up the dealing with cars and pedestrians together. Chatham Village, you know, you've been there, absolutely beautiful place, but if you notice, they, they never intersect. You know, the cars are one side, pedestrians the other, and, they, and they actually trained an entire generation of traffic planners never to deal with 
pedestrian cars comprehensively. So that's what we need to start doing is starting dealing with these kinds of things. So that when when you're a, when you're a car, you're driving through there. You know you need to be driving slowly because you need to be aware that you're sharing that space with pedestrians. So we've been doing this in cities all around. This is Boca Raton. You can see the palm trees here, and it always makes places look better when you have palm trees. But the, the, um, this was a, a very busy intersection. The idea of kind of putting um, paving and patterns and things like that to make it feel like it's a um, like it's a place that has that shared kind of environment. Um, and then also, you know, working on the sidewalk experience, and I've seen there's been some great uh, changes here, um, particularly underneath the library. There's been some, you know, kind of daytime markets, and I know that Square Hill does a lot of this stuff. This is great. I think doing more of this and kind of trying to bring the sales experience out into the environment is, um, is going to be better. Um, the other thing, and I, this is kind of a wish list item, but uh, this is in South Lake Union in Seattle, one of our projects. Um, but the idea of rooftop dining uh, would be absolutely fantastic in Squirrel Hill as it kind of grows. The idea that you can actually look at the city and see things. But those are kinds of things that you're seeing in East Liberty that I think would be great um, and to try to bring it here. This is in New Haven. Uh, some of these kind of alleyways that you see that go back into the parking would be great to kind of get rid of the parking in the future and actually use these alleyways for retailing um, and, and actually bring the environment back into smaller little squares that I think could be quite, quite remarkable. Um, in terms of the sidewalk experience, I need to actually uh, mention this too. There's not enough benches in Squirrel Hill. I don't know if you guys agree with me on this one. And, and then they also they locate the you know the, the trash can right next to that, so you don't want to sit there because you're smelling the trash. And it's in the mayor's name. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, you can't even have two benches side by side, so you can actually talk to each other and have a conversation, have a family there. Uh, that's something that I think as a retailers to get together and to make a, a concerted effort to make changes like that would make an environment change. There's, there was a long time ago in the 50s, there was actually, there was, an there was an idea and this kind of disappeared. There used to be benches in cities, but they actually, retailers used to try to get them out of there because they thought that if people were sitting, they weren't shopping, <laughs> which is completely different. The other thing I, I was thinking a little bit that I think Squirrel Hill could, could benefit from is kind of a wayfinding. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, is that I think that downtown Squirrel Hill is the center of the wheel uh, for all of Squirrel Hill. It makes uh, it, it gives uh, Squirrel Hill a kind of identity, and I think it keeps um, um, it kind of um, kind of culturally becomes the place that where people come together. And an idea of a signage that could say Carnegie Mellon, you know, a mile down the road, uh, Chatham uh, uh, mm -hmm. University this way, but also you know just a block to Giant Eagle, those kinds of things. It doesn't necessarily, it's not that you know, people don't know that. It helps remind people, but it also tells you that you care about your place, and that you care about connecting people together and providing that conduit. So this is kind of an example of some signage there on the top left. But, so anyway, going back to this, this is uh, where I'll conclude, kind of that, that there is some issues for Squirrel Hill. I think it's improving mobility. Um, it's preserving the character and supporting the downtown. How would you move forward? I think, I think that one of the important things is asking people for their opinion. As I, uh, you guys asked me for my opinion, I gave it, but I'm one of uh, uh, thousands and thousands of people that I think could give, provide very interesting opinions on where Squirrel Hill could, could go. And thinking forward, where do you want to be in the next 20 years? And I think Squirrel Hill has something remarkable. Um, it should be maintained. Finally, building consensus around common ground. Um, I think there's a lot of things that people can agree with in Squirrel Hill. And finally, communicating those goals and objectives so that when new development comes in, this is where we want to be, and this is how you, you should do it. I think, I, I, I can tell you that Squirrel Hill is something that's remarkable, it's very special to me, and I think it's absolutely worth your investment and time uh, to continue it, to keep it where it is. So thank you very much. I think I went a little over, but I can take questions. Yes, I know you had a question. Oh, yeah. so. centers in downtown in, in Squirrel Hill, so I was trying to give it a kind of context, but you're right about, um, you mean the Forbes and Murray, this, this, 
Is that what you mean by that? Yeah, I'm using this as downtown Squirrel Hill. Oh, okay. I'm sorry if I didn't clarify that early on, but there, yeah. you know, there's a, there's a neighborhood center mm -hmm. on Northumberland, and then there's, you know, there's down at the end of Murray, and the, you know, there's kind of other ones. So I was kind of using downtown Squirrel Hill, um, probably not in the most uh, most authentic way. But I do I do think that downtown uh, Pittsburgh um, has has a ways to go. But I think there's a, there's a lot of changes. But you're right, there was an incredible retail environment that was down there. Uh, my firm actually, um, my my colleagues actually did a master plan for the Fifth and Forbes corridor to hopefully bring retail back. And most of that plan was to fight the idea of trying to make that a kind of there was one point where they were going to actually tear it all down and make a mall, um, but hopefully they're going to kind of. But the idea was a preservation plan, and unfortunately, I don't know if you've heard about it. PNC is actually building a building that's going to take out a lot of the fabric of Fifth, which was actually something that was quite remarkable, um, a remarkable stretch of uh, buildings. Yes. Uh, I think you have a lot of very useful ideas for our community and impressive ideas. I would like to ask the audience to raise their hands, anyone who is a member of the Squirrel Hill Urban Coalition, because that is presumably the organization that is meant to be the um, uh, catalyst for some of the things you're talking about. And it may be that you're talking to the wrong audience. <laughs> Who is here from the Squirrel Hill Coalition? Okay, we're talking about three people out of, what, 50 or 60 uh, people. And I'm sorry that uh, more members of that organization are not present here to hear what you have to say. Well, thank you, Ms. Blood. <laughs> Question, the Squirrel Hill Urban Coalition is working on, <coughs> excuse me, what we call the, the Porter Project, mm -hmm. Forward and Murray, mm -hmm. um, making the entrance to Squirrel Hill, once you come off the parking lot or Beachwood, uh, a pleasant place. I'm mm -hmm. surprised you didn't mention that as a, a thing that we need here. Well, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, um, I didn't know you were working on that on that one, but it's, cer it's certainly a, a, a place that um, uh, could, uh, definitely needs some uh, some attention. So I appreciate it. The, the, no, you're working on the parking lot of Fort, you said Forbes and Murray or Forbes? No, no, no like forward. Down oh, forward. Forward. Oh, down forward, and forward and Murray. Forward and Murray. Forward and Murray. Okay. Have you it's noticed the little lighting that goes up? Uh, yeah. Um, Murray and the trees that go up Murray. Terrific. And the Ohana corner. Right. Yes. <laughs> Well, that, well, Murray is actually interesting. Um, I actually had, at some point, I actually did look at a little bit of maybe considering kind of the differences between the two, but I want to keep my presentation short. But I, 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 it's interesting because when you look at Murray uh, Forbes in, in context of Murray, Murray is a completely different type of retail environment. Mm -hmm. And it's actually a, a much more movement serving. There's kind of a food district first, and then we go down the hill, it's kind of more professional services oriented, so, so forth. But that, that is a kind of key, you're right, that's actually a key corridor. In the, Verizon building is sitting kind of square in the in the middle of it, which could become a great. Um, We're talking to that too. at some point. So. <laughs> well, uh, yes. I just wanted to say that you talked a lot about pedestrians, um, mm -hmm. but I live in Squirrel Hill, but not close enough to walk, and I won't come here up to this part sometimes because I just can't find parking mm -hmm. or the meters. I don't know if they've changed them since, but mm -hmm. uh, to our meters, you can't go to a movie in a restaurant yeah. and. And I agree with you about the line markings all over Pittsburgh. Um, you take your life into your hands when, you know, I read with trepidation about what they're planning for, for Forbes by Carnegie Mellon because yeah. when you're dealing with line markings mm -hmm. and taking a lane away and like Forbes going up to, um, mm -hmm. up to the park now, which is constricted with a bike lane that very few people use, I'm sorry, but, um, you know, there's sometimes where a bike lane doesn't make much sense, but, um, yeah. Um, anyway, parking, I think, is a big issue in this world. Parking is the, the number one issue wherever we go. It's, it, in fact, it, it's usually that it determines the amount of development. It always comes up as something, in, in, in all of our community discussions, people always talk about parking. Um, I always feel like it's a double-edged sword in some ways, because if you build too much parking, if you build the parking for um, Easter Sunday, it kind of, to borrow a phrase, um, you, you don't have a sense of place or an exciting community. Um, the other, the other thing is, if, if you have a parking problem, it, it sometimes means that there's a, there's a good thing that people want to be there. The problem is you don't want to exclude the additional opportunities, like you said, you've 
decided not to travel because of the, uh, you, you can't find a parking space. So parking is always, uh, always, always an issue. I think the key is not necessarily building enough parking, it's managing parking appropriately. Yeah. Um, it's generally the way uh, we, we usually uh, recommend um, people look at it and, and engage parking consultants to think creatively about solutions that allow all these kinds of things to happen. Um, so I, I actually can find parking all the time in Squirrel, but I'm not sure if I should share where I <laughs> find it. Because <laughs> then there won't, be a, there won't be a parking space. But you're right, it's actually very, very, very challenging. You know, there's, a, there's another issue with this corner. Mm -hmm. uh, a few years ago, they put in walk lights. Okay. Oh, they did? Uh, yes. Which is a very good idea, except uh, we, we live in Ray's building, where he lives in our building. Oh, yeah. You know, so we use this corner, this intersection all the time. Yeah. I would say 50% of the pedestrians don't know that to push a walk light. Yeah. Which, uh, now, mm -hmm. four of the eight walk lights have their covers falling off anyway. Mm -hmm. One of them has a cute little screw that you push with your thumb. <laughs> uh, it's not maintained, and, it, and it's mysterious. <laughs> Nobody knows it's there. If you're a stranger and you're looking to walk diagonally across that intersection, it's not clear how to do this. And this is a problem that we that, that we have all the time. Uh, that, that so you end up with people walking when there's no walk light. But the worst thing is the 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 drivers don't know that there's a pedestrian walk light because there's no way for them to know and so they they turn they go through the walk light I think often without realizing it's there. There are those people who jump the light. Well, that's, okay. You know, but it's a mat the you know, it's one of these situations where the city puts it up and then walks away and you're on your own. Well it's a it's it's a problem because when you look at it, it's it's a key to well first of all somebody's gonna get hurt. Right. Uh, that's number one. Right. Um, number two is that it's, it's that when you, the, the walkers and the pedestrians are the ones that are shopping in Squirrel Hill. It's not the drivers because they're driving right. through. So, so, you know, really, they're, they're, it would be important to communicate to the city the priorities of the pedestrian safety right. and the pedestrian environment to the city. So you're absolutely right. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, key, it's a key piece. Yeah. Eric, uh, you've been talking with a lot of praise about Squirrel Hill uh, uh, tonight. I think it's important to note that that didn't happen automatically, and the Urban Coalition has been a critical part of a lot of the stuff that's gone on here, and will continue to be. But talking about the downtown, there there's a reality, I'll call it the, the non-little factor, retail has changed. And and I think Squirrel Hill has a, a special challenge. Actually, some old-timers feel it more than I do, because I think the replacement of restaurants has been pretty good paced here. But when you had a neighborhood like that was very much based on small retailers, mm -hmm. much more, I think, than Shadyside ever was, That's true. and that animal disappears, it becomes that much harder to make the change and to make the ma and maintain it. What I see happening is a lot of the spaces have been filled with a lot more restaurants before. Mm -hmm. And as someone who's only lived here 10 years, I think more that it's better rather than worse because because there are nice opportunities here. But I hear from a lot of folks who've lived here before that they're feeling that something's been lost. It's a, it's a difficult part of um, communities because they do change. Um, they all change, um, you know, in the way that cities are used. And so, in some ways, it's 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 a little bit it's hard to. Um, find the right place because, you know, you want, it, you yearn for the way things used to be. Um, I grew up in a community outside of Chicago and we had our own hardware store. Um, and there's still a hardware store here, which quite reminds me of the one that I used to shop in. Um, um, oh, there's a hardware, hardware store sign. There's a right, 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 right. There used to be. It's a place, right above the Mexico. We used right to be, there used to be four hardware stores. Yeah. Four hardware stores four. within 1,800 feet of each other. Yeah. We have zero. But that's that, our fault. But we did not patronize them. So, you know, yeah. so that's so, okay. So when, when, I, when I always think about the going to my hardware store when I grew up in Chicago, um, it, it disappeared, but it, it, it had fantastic service. It, it's a part, there was never any mechanism to bring that back. 
Right. Like you mentioned, we didn't support our hardware store like we should have. Um, and, and in the end, cities have to be able to address economic need, when, it's particularly during hard times. Great cities, great businesses are always defined during hard times. You always find out really what you're made of. And when, when you see, like right now, there's actually great success of restaurants and, and things that are working, you're starting to see that's something that can work not only in the difficult times, but they can really flourish in the great times. So there's a part of, a part of cities is letting, let, letting them grow and evolve, but also how do you, is it, does it still feel like Squirrel Hill? I think is the kind of key question at the end of the day. And if it's something that you feel good about and you feel proud that you're still your neighborhood, I think that it's been successful. So. I'm on the board of the Squirrel Hill Urban Coalition, and uh, Roger over here is also. I'd like to mention to the group that we're at work on a new updated 20-year master plan. Um, part of that is intended to be a parking and traffic study in the neighborhood, where right now uh, we've been promised about half the money from the URA, and the other half we're looking for. But that's very definitely on the on the horizon, okay. and um, I'm also trying to work with the merchants in in looking at the whole retail picture, how how it can change in a good way, uh, how the district can be branded, as you say, um, and strengthened. So uh, everybody here should be members of the coalition if they're not already. We're, we're in the thick of it, and we intend to be. Sounds pretty good. So join the coalition. So, I was really pleased at your unembarrassed endorsement of um, traditional buildings styles, even if they're kind of appliqued on enormous buildings. But right? actually, the JCC, under pressure, I believe, really improved its plan for its building that goes um, from Darlington down to yeah, D D Darlington to. B -b 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 Bartlett. 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 Yeah, and it's very, it has, it's a huge building, but it's mm -hmm. quite clever the way it, it tries to fit in better. How's our project? Ah, good. <laughs> um, well, good. Um, we wish there'd be more pressure put on the um, that building that you showed the entry of. Mm -hmm. It's true, actually, people in Square Hill kind of like modern, they want to be kind of a bit zippy, mm -hmm. but that some of these, these things don't work out very well. It's going as far back as Imperial House or Maxim Towers. Mm -hmm. They're both, they're blight, you know, they're mm -hmm. blight. And the thought that something could at least tell yeah. us more about your... Well, I always feel like that, that, that are generally that there are uh, things that are transcend style, uh, that scale, and massing and building shape. Um, there are building shape elements about project that you described the JCC, you can see it in the roof forms that have a residential feel that somewhat feel like what it was replacing has been, has been is there some sort of memory of that. Um, and then there's a scale to the windows, um, and I think there's a human scale to the building too. Uh, there's, there's kind of elements that actually give it, articulate the stories and so forth, and, and a kind of interconnectedness about it. So those kinds of things I think are transcend style number one, and those, those I think should be embedded in whatever style. When it comes to traditional architecture, I do feel like Squirrel Hill, that it belongs in Squirrel Hill much more than modern architecture because I think that it somehow feels like it's been somewhat parachuted in. It's very difficult to walk the line of creating a building that's modern and that people can embrace, but at the same time, it has a kind of pattern to it um, that is something that belongs somewhere. To do that, you have to be very clever about the proportions of windows and the materials that you use, the way you approach a building. A lot of times people, architects, and uh, people think about um, uh, the actual building as an object, but they don't necessarily feel well, what the experience is from to go from the street to the building, which when you look around Squirrel Hill, there's all these remarkable examples of that, about you know steps and zigzagging and porches and things like that. So that's why I chose the entry, because I think that's sometimes a key element of, of, uh, of architecture. So um, it's kind of the experience outside the building and how it makes the street. But I think that generally that you're right, it's, in, it's, it's somewhat of an issue that new buildings should feel like they belong here. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>
Uh, I won't mention names, but we got promises to get some help in setting up during meetings, and that is before meetings, and that so slowly drifted away. So just a reminder, we would love to see some people here at 7 to help set up chairs for these meetings instead of the core group group doing it every time. Come and see us next month, and uh, thanks for coming out on a cold night, and happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> Don't forget your fortune cookies. And your cream puffs. We want good fortune. <laughs>